But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to the Lord for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. We've come to what is the pivotal point in the letter. What is it that the Apostle Paul prays for the church that has been started through his preaching, that has been found to be established, going well, standing, what does he want next? Chapter 3, verses 11 to 12, which are our study for today, 11 to 13, are the hinge of the whole. The prayer is repeated in much of its substance right at the end of the letter. Before it, we have two great blocks of thanksgiving as Paul gives thanks, first for the work that has started in Thessalonica, chapter 1, verse 3, through to chapter 2, verse 12, and then that, that work which was started is ongoing, chapter 2, verse 13, through to chapter 3, verse 10. The church is standing, it's well established, it's healthy. And last week we looked at that great statement by the apostle, chapter 3, verse 8. What a remarkable challenge this is to us in our own Christian faith as we think about others. Now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. This is life to us. This is what we live for, that you stand fast. But given that this church really is standing fast, what then is it that the apostle longs for it? What would the great apostle pray for a Christian worker who's gone out from St. Helens 20 years ago and is engaged in a ministry somewhere, uh, anywhere in the world? What would he pray for each of us if we're city workers as we seek to engage in the work of the Lord Jesus in the office in which he has placed us? What does the Apostle Paul, or would the Apostle Paul, pray for the congregations of St. Helens? Well, here it is in verses 11 through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. A renewal of gospel ministry, an abundance of gospel love, a consistency of gospel living. More faith, more love, more hope, a renewal of gospel ministry. That's verse 11. Now, I guess it would be possible to read verse 11 simply as a desire from Paul to refresh his relationship with them. Oh, we're good mates. We had a great time together. Let's get together again. And we've heard Paul's passionate concern for these Thessalonians. He was there, I think, probably for a matter of months engaged in Christian ministry there, three Sabbaths in the synagogue, then he was turfed out, engaged in a Gentile mission, but he was there, and he describes himself then as having been orphaned from them. Such was his love for them. We've looked at his emotional engagement with them. They are his hope, his joy, his glory, and his crown. Simply to see it, though, as, you know, it would be great to get together again, misses the point. For Paul, his travel plans cannot be separated from his ministry work. Verse 10, he wants to supply what is lacking in your faith. 
So it's not just kind of, oh, let's get together again. It's actually reunion for the sake of strengthening faith through the teaching of the apostolic gospel. What he's praying is that he may visit them in order that they may, he, he may engage in more teaching of the apostolic faith. Now, we've said this over and again here on Tuesday lunchtimes, but it was Paul's normal pattern with the churches he served to visit them, to visit them again, and to revisit them. Paul may be described by some as a church planter. It's not strictly accurate. Paul should rightly be called a church builder. He planted the seed of God's word. He built the church. And that's why he constantly returned. You know, if there were a 29th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, it would be as much about Paul strengthening the church as anything else. That's why he sent Timothy back to them to establish them in the faith, to encourage them. And we can see this from Paul's repeated visits in Acts. Once planted, he made it his ambition to return, to establish and to encourage. And that is precisely what we find going on in this letter. And what does Paul want for those who've been established in and through apostolic ministry? More of the same. And so if I may speak to both audiences here, both returning Christian workers in churches all around the world and us gospel workers here working in offices wherever we happen to find ourselves, you know, many of us here are Christian city workers. We're seeking to do the work of God in the office in which he's placed us. And we meet to pray. We seek to encourage one another. I'm involved in a work just like that in one of the banks down, uh, near, the, uh, down um, near, the, near the mansion house. 10 to 20 of us meet every Monday lunchtime. And the work has been established. What does the Apostle Paul pray for such a work? More of the same. Nothing new. More teaching of the apostolic faith. Now, many of us here have gone out from St. Helens and now working in all the different places we just talked about. You might have got a little work established, just got started. What does the apostle pray for that work? More of the same. Nothing new. In fact, my hope is that for those of you who are returning to St. Helens after a while away, when you get home, you know, your kids, your, um, your wife, your husband, friends will say, oh, what's new at St. Helens? And I hope you might say, nothing. It's rather dull, except it isn't dull because it's the apostolic gospel that's going on. We're just doing the same. I shouldn't even say that. We are doing the same thing. I remember a visit from a great friend of ours here in England. Um, he's from Australia, Philip Jensen. I asked him what should happen next with the gospel partnerships, which we just got started all over the country. And as he got into the car, he said, just keep doing the same thing for the next 30 years. Well, he was in his 70s then. He knew just how difficult it was going to be. Some will have heard of David Jackman. The way in is the way on. It is the work of teaching the apostolic gospel that got the ministry started in Thessalonica. It's precisely the same work that is going to sustain and grow the ministry in Thessalonica. And if you've become a Christian in the last weeks or months, it's this same gospel. Every now and then, perhaps every five years or so, some fresh fad emerges in the UK Christian scene, which promises to be the new answer, some silver bullet. No, apostolic ministry, teaching the word. That's what it's all about. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. But this renewal of apostolic ministry gives way to an abundance of gospel love. And in verse 12, Paul uses two words which mean, in effect, to multiply. It has the impact of producing a super superlative. So to increase, may the Lord make you increase. To increase is to exceed, to be great, to be more. And abound. To abound is to overflow. It's the word used when Jesus fed the 5,000 and they were just overflowing with leftovers. So what is Paul's desire? Uh, we've heard back in chapter 1 of the work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope. 
He wants more, much more of the same. That as the apostolic gospel is taught, which is the good news of the God of love, so this love planted in the congregation at Thessalonica super overflows with an abundance of gospel love. I mean, what is God? God is love. How has God loved us? He shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What is the great command of Jesus? That you love one another as I have loved you. How is it that Jesus has loved us? Greater love has no man that they lay down their life for their friends. And so as Paul engages in speaking the gospel, the truth of God and his love, So his prayer is that love of those who come to see that they are loved by God super overflows in a multiplication of love for one another and for all. Here's an old commentary written in the 1970s by a chap called Ernest Best. The pattern for man's love is God's love. God never loves in order to achieve some good for himself but to bring good to those whom he loves. He love, love involves the forgetting and giving of self. One of the best books on our bookstall, Don Carson, The Call to Spiritual Reformation. It is on the bookstall, isn't it, Jason? I hope it is. Yeah, I've got a thumbs up. There it is. Christian love, mature, deep, and unqualified, is a rare commodity. When it is displayed, it speaks volumes to a society that gorges itself in self-interest, lust, mutual admiration pacts, and knows very little of love. And somebody says, well, what does that love look like in practice? And the answer is provided in verse 12. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. So this superabundance of love will look precisely like the practice in which Paul engaged as he exercised his relationship with the Thessalonians. He labored with his hands in order to supply his own needs so he wouldn't be a burden on them. He wanted to be there in the office to speak the gospel. That was his great aim, but he got on with his job, as it were, in order to be able to do it. He experienced hostility and hatred and even put his own life on the line as he'd gone about boldly proclaiming the gospel. He changed his travel plans in order to seek to spend time with them. I think of one very, very senior businessman flying all over the world. But whenever he went, and some of you have experienced this, whenever he went to a particular city or another city, he would look out a Christian group in order to go and encourage them. Such love. Paul made deeply costly personal move of sending his best man, Timothy. At the very moment when he needed him most in Athens, he sent Timothy off at great cost to himself. He'd taken the trouble to write. He had invested his whole self. Just look across the page to chapter 2, verse 8, in that column at the top of the page there. So, being affectionately desirous of you, We were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you become so very precious, so dear to us, tangible, practical, costly, tough, unpopular, uncomfortable, selfless, sacrificial love. One of the guys who works with us here at St. Helens went to visit somebody, one of you, here in the, in the building the other day in their office. And they came back and they said it was remarkable. He's quite a senior guy. He seems to know everybody. And he knows personal details about them. And he asks about them. He knows some of their children's names and what their worries and concerns are. Such love. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. Some of us will remember VJ Menon, uh, still alive, uh, still, um, still VJ. Uh, VJ, remember, did not 
take promotion for year after year after year in order to be free to share the Christian gospel with colleagues around him in the Lloyd's Market. Such love. And the 200 here before us today coming back to rejoin us. Every one of you will have invested your life in the particular ministry to which you've given yourself. What is Paul's desire? More of the same. Uh, Did you notice the for all there in verse 12? May your love superabound for one another and for all. God so loved the world he gave his only son. Our love is to be modelled on Jesus' love. The love of Jesus is a love for all of humanity. Even the person we find less lovable is to be loved. Christ died for the sins of the whole world, and Paul expects us to love all. However unlovely they may seem to us, they are deeply loved by God. I think it's possible to grow a little jaded in this, a bit cynical, to develop a love deficit. How did Paul deal with it? Well, 2 Corinthians tells us, the love of Christ compels me. I have concluded that one died for all. He looked at the cross. And his letters are full of this prayer that our love may abound more and more with knowledge and depth of insight, Philippians 1, that we might know the height and breadth and depth and length of the love of God, Ephesians 3. May your love abound and increase. Imagine a little group in our office where people loved one another and everybody. Imagine it in the village or the town. Now, verse 13, really strikingly, I thought long and hard about verse 13 because it begins with a causal clause. Did you notice that? So that it seems to be Paul's understanding that the two preceding requests result in this third outbox, that the apostolic gospel, which produces this superabundance of love, will itself lead to hearts established blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. So together, the renewal of apostolic ministry, strengthening the faith of the Thessalonians, leads to a superabundance of gospel love, which then fixes the hearts of the Thessalonians, blameless in holiness at the coming of the Lord Jesus. You know that word established, it is basically, the root word is word, the word root, rooted. Think of the gherkin, 333 pillars or piles, a meter wide, driven 30 meters into the London clay. Rooted. That's Paul's concern. Think of the great oak tree that you pass on your morning walk. It's a, it's a favorite word used to describe Paul's return visit work all through Acts here in Thessalonians. Paul is all about completion. The heart is the place of thinking and decision making. It's where we set our course and determine the direction of our lives. May he establish your hearts. It's our internal self, the control center of our being. May he he fix the control center of your being, blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of Jesus with all his saints. So so Paul is a completer finisher. He's no cowboy builder. He, He wants these churches to be truly fixed. And he has in mind the tape at the end of the marathon rather than the trinkets along the way. He's not content simply with the individual converted. He longs for the person to make it to the end. And the way that person is going to make it to the end is through the teaching of the word of God and the love of the gospel community in which they find themselves. And to be blameless in holiness 
is objectively true of every Christian. And the moment we become a Christian, the Lord Jesus confers on us the status of a holy person. That distinguishes Christianity from every other religion. The moment you put your trust in Jesus, God says this individual in Christ is perfect, blameless in holiness. And yet Paul seems to want us not to just go on trusting in the gospel, but actually to develop in our subjective holiness, if you like, the practice of holiness, that we become more and more holy. You might say that we are what we have become. I mean, I said yesterday in a group down in one of the banks, which is a French bank, I mean, imagine if I were to become French. I mean, the French people in the room almost fell off their chairs laughing. But just imagine for a moment, there are a few French people with us today, the horror of it. You'd never have me. I know you wouldn't. But anyway, just imagine it were allowed. Well, there'd be a whole renovate. I mean, I might have French on my passport or Francais or whatever it happens to be, but there would be a whole renovation work to do, wouldn't there? See somebody from French-speaking Belgium here, they see there really is a renovation to be done. Yeah, there would, a whole renovation. Well, may the Lord make you blameless in holiness at the coming of the... So Paul seeks more of the same, more of the same, more of the same. He has in mind the end point. And the rest of this letter spells out what such blameless in holiness looks like. It's, if you like, Paul's blueprint for Christian living. I'm really looking forward to getting into it uh, next Tuesday, the, the, the rest of the letter. Interestingly, he begins with sexual conduct. We must finish. Two things we haven't really spoken about yet. Of course, this is all a prayer. It's all of God. Uh, We thank God for you, verse 9. We feel joy before God about you, verse 9. We pray day and night, verse 10. May God our Father, verse 11. Verse 12, may the Lord, verse 13, so that he may establish. Insofar as we think this to be a human project, so far will we fail to pray. Insofar as we fail to pray, So far will the weight fall on our own shoulders. Insofar as we see this to be a divine, this is what God is doing in the world. Calling out a people to belong to him. So that on the great day of the return of Jesus, when Jesus comes with all his people, all his saints, all those who've trusted in him, all those who have been made holy, on that great day, every man, woman, and child who's put their trust in Jesus, as the faith has been fixed in them, as they have grown to love deeply and this hope of the return of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. I've never been in a great victory parade. It's not because my team has never won, but I've never actually been. I mean, you people from Chelsea and Manchester United, Liverpool, you've all done this kind of thing. But there's a far greater victory parade than a tinny little trinket from the FA Cup or whatever it happens to be, and and, and a London bus and an open top. There's a far greater victory parade, the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And the Apostle Paul prays an abundance of faith, a superabundance of love, an assurance of hope that we're there on that day with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Well, I'm simply going to read this prayer and we may say amen at the end. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Direct our way to you. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen.